Hey everybody, welcome to the Super Fast Instagram Q&A. Let's go. Super Fast Instagram Q&A. Are you on tour with Sungazer? No, but I soon will be. Links are in the description. How can I learn the bass clef quicker? The big thing with reading sheet music is just to do it a lot. Intellectually, sheet music is very easy to understand, but it takes many, many years to be able to do it fluently. The basic idea is very straightforward, all cows eat grass, but consider how long it took you to read your native language. You can read and parse these syllables very, very quickly, but it's only because you were doing it over and over and over again for many hours a day. So when somebody says they are bad at reading music or when they don't feel like they can do it at a high level, to me, that just means, well, you haven't practiced enough. If you need something to read, go on imslp.org and start looking through all the stuff that Bach ever wrote. That'll keep you busy for a while. What is this chord? A, C sharp, F, G sharp. So yeah, that's an A major seven, sharp five. And technically speaking, that F should be spelt as an E sharp because the E, the fifth degree of the scale, has been raised a half step, sharp five. And I agree, I love the sound of the major seven, sharp five. It's very mysterious sounding. There's this tension there, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like it needs to go anywhere in particular. For me, this really comes from the augmented triad, the root, the third, and the sharp five at the base of this major seven sharp five chord. And that tang that comes from that augmented sharp five really is accentuated with the tang that comes from that major seventh, creating a very tangy chord with the intense orange taste of tea. For this reason, I don't really recommend overusing this sort of color, the same way that I don't recommend drinking too much tang. But because there's a lot of mystery there and almost a lot of danger there, it works really well at the end of spy movies. At the end of the arrangement that Zack Zinger did for the Bit Awards last year for Just Cause 4, he insisted on the color of the major seven sharp five. And for good reason. The major seven sharp five told the story that needed to be told. With the intense orange taste of What's the secret to having an interesting life? Don't be afraid to say yes to new opportunities and travel often. You'll probably have a pretty interesting life. What are your thoughts on David Bowie's Black Star? Yeah, that album is really amazing. It's kind of David Bowie's swan song before he passed. It's such a unique sounding record. If you haven't heard it, Check it out, I love it. I loved how Bowie worked with his backing band, which is a jazz band led by Donnie McCaslin. The story goes is that he walked into the 55 bar seeing Donnie McCaslin's group playing with Mark Juliana, Tim LaFave, and Jason Lindner. David Bowie knew immediately that he wanted that group to play on what would end up being his final album. Now to me, these musicians are at the top of their craft. They're some of the most amazing musicians I know in the world, but the way that Wikipedia credits them is a group of local jazz musicians. <laughs> So I guess if you're working with David Bowie, anybody is going to be a group of local jazz musicians in comparison, so there's that. How do I get good at jazz and how do you take your coffee? The same answer for both. Drink black coffee. Oh God, yeah. This video, by the way, was brought to you by Black Coffee. Not only the jazz standard made popular by Ella Fitzgerald, but Trade, a subscription coffee service which has partnered with 50 of the nation's best roasters featuring over 400 different kinds of coffee. Yes, I, uh, I am very excited to have a coffee sponsorship. Trade sent me coffee based on a taste profile they had made for me when I took a quiz on their website. The fancy Doma coffee they sent me was both chocolatey and delicious. As many of you know, I drink coffee every morning. It's part of my routine. First, I very carefully measure out the grounds into a French press, then very gingerly pour hot water in concentric circles over the grounds. Then I let the grounds steep, maybe stirring once or twice, before filtering the grounds and then grabbing the nearest real book. I then ritualistically pour the coffee over the face of the real book, as is required by the jazz gods. This is the secret to jazz. There we go, that real book's looking nice and coffee stained. Now we're ready to enjoy our coffee. Mmm. That looks delicious. Trade is giving the first 100 people who click the link below 30% off your first coffee. Just click the link in the description and you too can unlock the secret of jazz. How often do you see bass clarinet in jazz? So the great Eric Dolphy made bass clarinet his primary instrument. It's a unique timbre, but it, to me it's a really beautiful one. You'll also often see baritone sax players in jazz big bands double on bass clarinet. It blends exceptionally well with other woodwind instruments. It's a really nice color. And I think more people should play it in jazz because bass clarinet's awesome. How did your band come up with the name Sungazer? I don't remember specifically when it happened, but we were looking for band names that were associated with brightness. So, Sun, Sungazer. And then the Simpsons created a fictional band name named Sungazer, so. By my favorite band from the 1980s, 
Sun Gazer. We were the first. We started doing it first. I swear. Uh oh, Dipsa did it. Dipsa did it. No, they didn't. We did it. Shut up. Is there any shame in not being able to play without looking at the keyboard or neck? I don't think there's any shame at all. If you need to look at the keyboard or the neck, you need to look at the keyboard or the neck. The problem arises when you get so sucked into the visual image of your instrument that you forget to look up and interact with your fellow bandmates. Staring at the keyboard or the neck is normally symptomatic of being so in your own world that you forget that you're making music with other people. Since you experience color when hearing a note, why do you not have perfect pitch? So I have synesthesia, which is the cross-modal pairing of more than one sense. And for some musicians, that might manifest as the ability to literally hear music as a color. So the note E might sound purple, like literally sound purple. This is called a photism and it's associated with a kind of synesthesia called chromesthesia. Chromesthetes, those who can hear sound as color, usually have perfect pitch, but I don't have perfect pitch. When I hear the note E, it doesn't really have a color to me. But if I think about the concept of the note E, the concept does have a color, and everything associated with playing an E and hearing an E in context has a color. The best way I know how to describe this is to take a look at the top image, which is in grayscale, and imagine what colors it would be if it were to have color. Now, most of the time we spend looking at images in black and white, we're not really thinking about this. We could imagine what the colors would be, but we don't really spend that much thought on it. The problems occur when the colors are switched on and they aren't what we would expect them to be. This looks a little strange. That's exactly the same thing when I look at this keyboard, which literally is in black and white. When I'm playing music and when I'm thinking about music, most of the time I'm not really imagining what the colors would be, although I know what they would be. But if the colors were turned on and they were wrong, it's the same effect for me looking at the bottom image as it is for all of us looking at the top image. This now looks right to me. It's important to note for me that this reaction is pretty immediate. It's not something that I have to think about. The same way that your reaction might be immediate looking at that top image when the color is wrong. Which is kind of interesting because I don't have a synesthetic like, perception of the sound of the music, but I have a synesthetic conception of the idea of music, if that makes any sense. Anyway, just wanted to share that. It's very difficult to share a personal experience and perception with other people, but I think that's the best analogy I can think of. Is mental instability beneficial to composition? Mingus. I really hate romanticizing mental illness, especially when it comes to music and the arts. I think people with bipolar disorder like Charles Mingus, as well as Jacob Pastorius, struggled with it their entire lives. And the fact that they wrote amazing music is not because of it, it's in spite of it. Romanticizing the illness dehumanizes the people who had to actually struggle through it, and I think that's a disservice to the artistry and craft of people like Charles Mingus and Jacob Pastorius. What is your favorite chord? It depends on the instrument and also my mood, but today I'm kind of feeling the vibe of this like C major spread voicing down here, voiced exactly like this. We got the C, we got the G, we got the E, and we got good vibes. Also maybe this chord. How do you cope with your mental health and being a musician? Yeah, so musicians tend to have this kind of myopic worldview where everything is about the work and the art and everything is about the thing that is in front of us. And we kind of forget about taking care of ourselves, taking care of our health, mental or otherwise. For me, that's something that I've kind of struggled with a little bit. And honestly, uh, running has helped a lot just in terms of keeping myself centered. I really kind of dislike running actually, but it does keep me centered and it does keep me in a routine and at the added benefit of being in better shape than when I wasn't running. Anyway, that's been working for me, but it is often a struggle. Thoughts on Esperanza Spalding. So about five years ago, I was playing at this ASCAP function related to this like ASCAP Young Jazz Composers Award thing that I had won. At that function, there were other people who were performing, including Esperanza Spalding. I remember being backstage and watching her warm up and it just being really amazing. She's this like really, really short person and she plays massive upright bass and she just dominates the instrument. There's like this physicality to her playing, which is really inspiring. And she's able to do that while singing too. Parallel fifths lick. Best Scott LaFaro recording. I mean, definitely Bill Evans live at the Village Vanguard. Scott LaFaro was an absolutely incredible upright bass player. He played very contrapuntally. He didn't play like walking bass lines, which fit very well in Bill Evans' kind of harmonic aesthetic. That record, Live at the Village Vanguard, is quite amazing to listen to, even like 50 years later. And unfortunately, Scott LaFaro died in a car accident just 10 days after that album was recorded at the age of 25. Had he lived, I honestly think he would have been one of the most influential bass 
bass players of all time, but unfortunately, he died very young. What happened to Inside Outside? Wow, okay, yeah, so Inside Outside uh, was a collaboration between myself, Sean Crowder, the drummer for Sungazer, and the Belgian pianist and composer Wim Leysen. I met Wim at the Manhattan School of Music, and Inside Outside actually started as the music for Wim's graduate recital. It eventually turned into more of a collaborative ensemble, and some of the music that we were making at that time, around 2012 and 2013, kind of sounds like the music that Sungazer would eventually make. <laughs> That was a tune of whims called Desert of the Real. Yes, it is a, uh, it is a Matrix reference. There's some music though that sounded fairly different. One of my favorites was a tune by Wim called Resonance, which featured this awesome soprano sax solo from Jonathan Raganis. Anyway, we recorded an album. We did a few live gigs, which I thought went pretty decently, but eventually the whole thing kind of fell apart because Wim had to move back to Belgium. And that kind of left Sean and I to think, well, like, what do we do from here? Well, we started Sungazer. So Inside Outside was kind of like a proto Sungazer. I have very fond memories of the project. Thank you for bringing it up. If you haven't checked out some of Inside Outside stuff, the link is in the description. Do jazz musicians be improvising over more modern pop hits to stay relevant? I mean, yeah, John Coltrane improvising over My Favorite Things was him using pop tunes of the day as a vehicle for a different form of artistic expression. He wasn't looking to the pop songs of like 50 or 60 years ago, like what a lot of jazz musicians do now. He was taking the music of his era and appropriating it for a different form of artistic and cultural expression, one which happened to be fairly avant-garde. What I'm trying to say is, we need more free jazz covers of Katy Perry. What did you play on your Berkeley audition? So my prepared piece for my Berkeley audition was the Maple Leaf Rag tapped on a seven string bass. It's the very first thing that I uploaded to YouTube back in 2006. At the time, I thought it was this very impressive technical thing that would wow them. But looking back on it, I know the judges were not impressed with that sort of thing at all. I'm sure they saw much more impressive from many more people. Tell us about the Scary Pockets session. Yeah, so I got a chance to play with Scary Pockets, which is the funk cover band that Jack Conti, Mr. Patreon himself, plays in. Anyway, the session itself was pretty interesting. We had about 90 minutes to create what's called a head arrangement, or an arrangement basically created on the spot. We knew the song that we were going to be playing Mbop by Hansen, but we didn't know like any of the riffs or arrangement details until we actually made them up on the spot. Really most of it was led by Jack and the guitar player Ryan Lerman. They kind of had an idea of how these sessions would go, so I kind of just stayed back and did my role as a bass player, but I did get in some sneaky like syncopation ideas as well as spicy chord ideas in there. You can kind of hear them in the chorus. But it was just a fun and productive session. I have to do more of that sort of thing in the future. Good group of musicians, good group of people, so. That was the Scary Pocket Session. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to check the link in the description to get 30% off your first order with Trade Coffee.